I don't know if you're going to be able to answer this because it's probably like BTC pay server where you don't know how many people are actually running them. But um, if there was a catastrophic failure to the internet, are there enough uh, Blockstream satellite nodes for Bitcoin to survive? Well, the Bitcoin uh, satellite network is more about redundancy. So those are being served by nodes that we are running, uh, Blockstream is running. So those, the, the transactions are being broadcast up and then back down. Um, I mean, it's good for redundancy. I don't know if it's good for catastrophic failure. Um, I still think you need a lot of people having their own nodes if we were, were to need to reboot the network after some major catastrophe, but definitely Blockstream Satellite could help keep that network uh, in sync and it could bootstrap, help bootstrap that new network, new network after the apocalypse. It's clear to me that you're a guy who's pretty knowledgeable about both the gaming industry and the crypto industry and probably other things as well, to be honest. Um, I mean, I, I have two different jobs within the crypto industry and I find that pretty difficult to like change the hat and, you know, juggle different things. And uh, But obviously you're working in two entirely separate industries, uh, but not only that, you know, you're doing it with quite a lot of success. So I guess my... Uh, my question here is like, hey, have you got any tips? Like, <laughs> what are you doing? Like, what's uh, tell me the secret sauce? I guess is my is my question. Well, I think um, I'm trying to bridge the two industries. Um, knowing how the game industry works, knowing the inner workings of you know how game developers and publishers think, uh, I think that gives me an edge, and I can figure out ways that we can kind of disrupt the status quo. So. I guess you could look at um, Infinite Fleet and a lot of the stuff that Pixelmatic and Exordium are doing uh, is taking the tech that Blockstream has built and trying to apply that to the game industry in a meaningful way. Um, so like we talked about, it's facilitating trade, um, making new models for players to manage their own assets like multi-sig wallets. And this, this all plugs into a lot of the ecosystem that we're trying to build up uh, at Blockstream. Like, you can get a Jade hardware wallet and store your NFT on that, right? And, and that would potentially help with some of the issues that the NFT space is facing. Like, you know, the, the, they're, they're using MetaMask or whatever and they get hacked and they lost their art collection or, or whatever, right? So I think there's better ways to do it. And for us, we'll just tightly keep integrated with pretty much everything Blockstream is building because I think a lot of the stuff that Blockstream is building is really foundational and really secure. So it's a way to apply that technology to a new industry, I believe, in the correct way. And also, it's a opportunity to really test the limits of that tech too. So we can potentially be one of the first to try streaming uh, INF tokens over a Lightning Network, right? To have a, a major Lightning Network for a non-Bitcoin asset at the base. But uh, advice, I think, is really just keeping your eyes open and looking for opportunities. <clears throat> like we like to say at Blockstream, we're rebuilding the future of finance. Uh, we're building a financial, new financial system on top of Bitcoin. And if you're building something completely new on a new base tech, there's just a ton of opportunities at your disposal. So one of the other things that we started pushing at Blockstream that I initiated, uh, I think in 2018, was doing security tokens on Liquid2. And again, like with a with Infinite Fleet, we're trying to raise capital using a security token, and we've met with uh, pretty good success. Blockstream itself has launched the Blockstream Mining Note, which is a security token that is securitized with uh, our hash rate. And that's also quite popular as well. But you can just see like there, there's a lot of interesting things you can do with this new technology that isn't just scamming people with ICOs <laughs> and rock NFTs. Right? You can actually apply it in meaningful ways. Uh, and I, I think the there's just a, a lot of things you can do. Okay, so I guess like you're, cause when, so on a working day, you're kind of part of your brain and part of your time is like, hey, how are we building these cool new sort of ideas around Bitcoin on Bitcoin? And then it's kind of like the second part is like, well, okay, we've built this awesome thing. How do we then use this to further what we're doing in the with our games and the game industry and, and on the separate? So I guess they kind of mesh together uh, and it's less of a kind of break in your, in your in your brain where you're trying to sort of go to these two different worlds. Um, that's kind of a cool yep. way to cool way to look at it, actually. I guess like when it comes to um, what you guys are up to at Pixelmatics, like because um, if you look at 
uh, what the games you guys have done is, is, a, is an MMO style game. And it's, and it's the first non-mobile game. Is that correct that you guys have done? Um, yeah, it's the first non-mobile game that Pixelmatic has done. But for most of us, we've done like uh, PC games in the past. So it's not really a big departure. It's just when I started Pixelmatic, our main focus was on doing mobile games because that was the rage back in you know, 2011. Um, how does it differ making a mobile game to making a larger, fully fledged sort of Windows operating system game like because obviously they're both computers technically but how, how is it how does it differ like is it is there, are there a lot of similarities or a lot a lot of differences i guess like what's the is it different like kind of a beast basically uh, to make yeah well i guess the biggest constraint is just the the size of the game um if you're building for desktop you can make things a lot bigger whereas for mobile you're typically trying to constrain yourself in terms of download size and that puts additional limitations on you know, how much stuff you can have in there, um, how complex the game can be, and how high res the art can be. Because if you're aiming for mobile, you're trying to aim for a very big audience across a vast array of devices and, and types of devices. So you kind of have to kind of play towards a lower common denominator. Whereas, I mean, there are exceptions to that rule. There are games that aim for very high end, but I, I don't know, you know how viable that is because for mobile games, you really need to aim for market share. So for us, like the, the scope of the game, I think is better suited for desktop um, because we want to build a very vast world. Like it's basically we're replicating the entire galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy in the game. So we need, uh, we need a lot of stuff in there. And I don't think you get that level of immersion in an MMO that you, you can get on the desktop in a mobile, mobile frame uh, framework. <clears throat> But we do want to have both components. So for our mobile, we'll probably do a companion app because a big part of the game is base building. So if you think of um, uh, RTS games like StarCraft, a lot of Infinite Fleet is inspired by RTS. You're kind of uh, resourcing, building, and fighting at the same time. And we wanted to kind of uh, separate those things. So you resource and you build on your downtime. And potentially that could be done on your phone. And then when you want to play and experience that cinematic combat, that's when you go to your, your desktop, right? So I think we can have the best of both worlds, which is, you know, you go to your desktop for that really immersive uh, experience where you're, you know, watching this beautiful battle vista. One of the things that we wanted to, to achieve was to uh, basically give you much more of that kind of Star Wars uh, vibe, right? Like when you go and watch Star Wars and you see the battle over a planet, that's kind of what we want to deliver at the end of the day. And I think that's the only format where we can do it um, on the PC. But then the other parts we can do on the phone. So you can manage your bases, manage your upgrades and resourcing and trade on your phone when you're you know, out and about or at the office. Yes, yeah, so like your commute to work, you can do like the other, the other bits or whatever. And then like you're waiting to get home to then play the full experience. That's pretty cool. Um, well, having said that, they've got that new Steam machine coming out uh, sometime, I think next year. That'd be pretty cool to see if you can run it on on that. And then it's like kind of almost the full mobile like a uh, nintendo switch dream when it comes to like uh computer gaming that'd be uh pretty yeah. awesome what would be the thing that you're like most proud of being involved in because obviously there's there's probably a lot of things that excite you in both the gaming and crypto and blended industries so what would you say is like the thing that you're like hey this is awesome like I, i'm glad i brought this thing into the world well i'm glad i'm bringing infinite fleet into the world <laughs> um it's in alpha now and it will be in beta next year but that's basically my baby uh, it's stuff that I've been thinking about for probably the past uh, five years. And now it's beginning to materialize. So it's uh, something I'm very proud of. And I'm really proud of the team behind it as well. We've got a lot of uh, superstar developers. So uh, we have Jason Lee. He's the uh, chief creative officer at Pixelmatic, but he was the lead designer on Age of Empires 4. And we have Wayne. He was also from the Age 4 team. He was the art director there. Now he's our art director. And we've got a ton of talent across the board. So I'm really excited for Infinite Fleet. But I guess um, in the Bitcoin space, uh, I think my biggest biggest contribution was during the block size wars and helping fight off the uh, the big blockers and the B cashers. And I think that's something I'm pretty proud of. Yeah, no, that's, that's quite cool. I, I like the, the two kind of different things. That, uh, one is like a sort of creation and one is like kind of a 
uh, like a, not a rebellious stand, but you know what I mean? Kind of like a, imagining it as like a general or something like fighting off a, fighting <laughs> off a, an attack, <laughs> I guess, uh, in one situation and then kind of like a, an architect in the other situation. I've noticed in uh, some of these other games that have uh, implemented their own token that there's been a phenomenon where people in developing economies are earning more playing the game than they would like at a minimum wage job in, in their economy. Um, do you think that you're going to see a manifestation of that phenomenon with infinite fleet? Um, potentially like people like to lump us in with the play to earn or blockchain games or game five category. And I, I think, you know, it's, it's a fair assessment because you can technically earn INF. Um, it's, not something that we're telling people like this is going to be valuable. It's just like World of Warcraft gold, right? <clears throat> it could be valuable if the there is demand for it, but it's not something we're going out and promising. And I think the key thing for us is that we're not selling uh, INF. It's meant to be just earned from social activities and participation in raids or other big events. So you know, it's definitely possible it'll be valuable, and someday you could uh, trade your INF for a Starbucks card on bit refill, right? <laughs> but um, uh, I think there is opportunity there for people to earn, like they could um, buy a ship, level it up and sell it to someone else. And they'd be trading their time for money to another player. And I think that's kind of what we wanted to do is um, democratize that entire aspect of the game. Like most games, they don't want you to do that. It's a I don't know, they want to lock you into their ecosystem, but in the end, like players will find a way to trade anyhow. Even if you deny that in the systems of the game, there's always a way around it. Like technically you can't buy and sell WoW gold, but you know, obviously there's ways to do it because people do do it. <laughs> and I, I know, even know developers at Blizzard that they themselves have bought WoW gold too. So it's kind of weird, you know, like the, the official stance is we don't want you to do these things, but then you know, even the, the developers at the company are doing them. So we think it's better from a ideological standpoint to just embrace the secondary market and accept that people are going to trade their time for you know, virtual currency or items. Why are these things that other gaming companies aren't doing, I guess is my question. And kind of like, because I'm trying to think what advice would you be giving to, you know, the guy running the ship at Ubisoft, for example? Um, do, do you think it's just because these these bigger companies are like more profit-driven machines and they kind of have to generate X amount of, of revenue or so they can't really take the time to innovate and they've just got to go with, hey, this works, this is going to make us money, let's get this out there? Um, or or what, I guess, what is it that you, you think isn't getting these guys to do what, what you're doing? Is it maybe they don't have a, a, as good understanding of Bitcoin as you do? Because obviously you've got that advantage of being involved in, in the space. And, and I, I guess, yeah, what, what is it do you think that is, is, is giving you that kind of advantage to be able to do this? There's a, a couple of questions packed in there. I guess the, the first one is game companies are very risk averse. Um, they don't like, like, this is why you have the sequels. And this is kind of why the RTS genre has not changed in, I don't know, 20 years. It's like the same formula. You have a single player campaign, a multiplayer campaign, and you have, you know, advances in graphics and physics and everything. But the, the, the core loop is really the same. You know, it's the same thing over and over and over. And I, I think it, it's just general risk aversion because they know they, if they have this IP, they can sell, you know, the fourth or fifth iteration of it and people will buy it because there's nostalgia. There's no forcing function to say we need to change it up and we need to be different. Um, and I, I guess uh, a lot of the game companies, there are public market, right? So they have, they have accountability to their shareholders in a way that you know, gives them even more pressure to deliver, right? The, the, the pressure when you get to that size is to make sure like, I don't know, the fifth version of this franchise generates this many hundreds of millions of dollars, right? It's not really about what you're doing in the franchise or how the gameplay works. It's more about this whole, whole block of thing, like how much revenue does this generate, right? That's the kind of thinking that typical game company executives are really processing on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and it, it gets kind of far removed. So you have the business side very distant from the development side, right? And there's often content there between you know budgeting and experimentation over you know proven tried it tried and tested business models that will yield a, a certain ROI on their investment in the game. 
So I, I think that is where the opportunity is. Like for us, we're very small, we're very scrappy. And it's really the, the players that have enabled us to, to undertake this experiment because they're investing in the game. And a lot of our backers also are from the, um, you know, the cryptocurrency and Bitcoin space, right? We have um, uh, Charlie Lee, he's an investor, Phil Potter, uh, Tether has invested, uh, but it's a lot of crypto people, crypto companies that are enabling us to do this. And I think they can understand there is this intersection, like Paulo from Bitfinex, he was a game developer before Bitfinex actually. So I think he can see what we're trying to accomplish here and the, the ground we're trying to break. I think I saw like a few little clips uh, of how the game uh, looks. And I was thinking, you know, the ideas you're coming up with here are awesome. So I'm just kind of like, why, why is no one else, you know, like, why is no one else trying to do it? As you said, you're a, you're a smaller company and, and you're scrappy and you've got the ideas. So I'm thinking, you know, normally when someone has an awesome idea and they're working on it, some big juggernaut tries to ruin it with some crappy, uh, you know, like fake kind of version where they've taken the ideas and made it like, uh, you know, kind of like an EA version of something. <laughs> like they've just made it behind like 50 billion paywalls or whatever. Um, so I was just wondering why they hadn't. But I guess yeah. I, I think, as, as you're saying, there's, there's risk in it. Um, and I guess also, potentially a, a lack of knowledge too right i suppose that like they don't necessarily know about i think there's be. another another part of it too now that i think about it it's like a lot of it has to do with me being in the bitcoin space so a lot of my thinking has been heavily influenced by bitcoin right and uh open permissionless systems and i think the the argument for bitcoin is the freest money wins and Bitcoin is the freest money, right? It's permissionless. Anyone can use it. It's uh, uh, everyone has equal footing in the network. Everyone can run their own node and they, you just can't compete with any fiat currency because those are centrally managed. And that also extends to a lot of altcoins too, which are also centrally managed. So the freest money will win. And if you take that kind of thinking, then the freest game will also win too. The one that has fewer restrictions on what you can do with your, your stuff, right? And I don't think that line of thinking is just going to exist at the big game companies because unless they're Bitcoiners as well, they won't see that. But uh, if you have a choice, like to invest years of your life playing an MMO game, do you want to play you know, Infinite Fleet where you can pretty much do anything you want? You can self-custody your own assets. Um, you know, We can't freeze your account and freeze your currency, right? Um, or do you want to play some big game from a big game publisher where they'll ban you and you lose everything at once, right? So I, I think the market will make a choice here. And I think once the market has made that choice, the big players might start to reevaluate their positioning and thinking. But right now, they're just so comfortable. There's no need for them to do anything. They'll just keep on bringing in the money. And also with the uh, COVID and the pandemic, you know, that has boosted the revenue of a lot of game companies. So I don't think they're really... They're really, they really need to think about anything um, in terms of the, the base modeling of how they, they build their games and monetize their games. Mm -hmm.